paste it so that it would fall. Yeah, that's if it's someone up there who's pulling it over. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's interesting to, um, what I think we would like to know more is the process behind your, how, how you work. As you, you told me, you, you, you never work for a show, it's a totally different process. Uh, no, I, I, I can't work specifically for shows. I used to do it when I, when I was younger, but I find that uh, it puts the paintings under pressure and I don't actually like having them put under that pressure and it also uh, it gives them a kind of time frame that they have to be finished in and I'm much more interested in uh, working on the painting so that they find their own time so that they have the possibility to, to find time without actually uh, having things having it imposed upon them so I try never to work specifically for a show I try to make the works and then afterwards decide you know, what possibilities I have for showing them. Uh, it suits me better. Yeah. And, and, and how does this process start? In, ter in terms of making the paintings, it, it, uh, I, 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 I begin by uh, making very simple decisions. Should the paintings be horizontal, should they be vertical? As I always work in groups, that's the first decision. Should the paintings be horizontal, should they be vertical? Then I tape upon the wall a kind of uh, a framework of what I think should be the size of the painting. And then I look at it for uh, uh, maybe a week, two weeks, maybe three weeks, and sometimes adjust it, move it around, and if I'm comfortable with it, then I order the stretches, the group of stretches, and then I start working on a group of paintings. And, uh, I may start with six, and once I've got those started, then I may order another six stretches, or even another eight or nine stretches. And uh, I get a whole group of paintings all on the go at once. So I have a period when I have maybe 10, 12 paintings all developing, but actually nothing finished. And I keep rotating them. I work on a painting for a week or two, I take it so far, uh, when I feel I'm stuck with it, then I put it aside and I go on to another one. And it may be uh, maybe six months before I come back to that painting again. And so from the beginning to the end, uh, a painting may be uh, one and a half to two years before it's actually finished. Uh, but, but it's not as if I'm working on it all the time, it's because it's been alternated with other paintings as I rotate them around. I, what I like about that is that uh, it means the paintings are never under pressure. There's never one painting that has to be finished. Uh, I can allow it to sort of find its own, uh, its own sense of time and its own sense of resolution. And I increasingly need that. I increasingly need that sense that the, uh, uh, that the painting is, is, is establishing, its, it's establishing its own time rather than it being imposed. It's, I mean, I th time is very important to me. The, uh, uh, I mean, we spoke about it earlier. The, 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 uh, I, I want paintings which are trying to slow things down, which are actually trying to uh, quieten things down, uh, that, that are uh, inviting the onlooker, the spectator, to actually stand still for a while, to actually disengage from the kind of uh, franticness of, of the modern world and the sort of modern media, and actually just be still for a while in front of the painting. So that, that side of things is very important to me. It's, uh, I think that paintings, uh, it's one of the few things they can still do is, is, is that uh, because there are so many other, other media out there that are also image based, I think one of the few things that paintings can do that is different is actually give you a kind of stillness, give you a kind of uh, quiet experience, contemplative experience. I know artists who spend weeks preparing the canvases, putting layer and layer of, of guests on it. How come that you always work on raw canvas? Uh, I just, uh, I just prefer it as a material. Uh, I mean, one of the first decisions I make when I'm making the pieces is whether or not uh, I should work on cotton or linen. I mean, for instance, this piece is uh, this is linen, so the sort of warm colour you can see coming through in the back here, that's actually the raw, that's actually the raw linen. 
And one, one of my first choices when I'm preparing the piece, which I consider part of actually the making of the piece, is whether I work on cotton or whether or not I work on linen. For me, um, linen sort of sucks in, it's sort of breathing in, it's pulling in the light. And it has a quite a different feel, whilst cotton duck, which some of the other pieces are, are painted on, has a much lighter feel, sort of breathing out. And uh, the, there's, a, there's a warmth to the material that I like, and, and quite often I work from, from behind, so I, quite often I put the paint on from, from behind and it actually seeps through. And of course I couldn't possibly do that if I was closing the surface off with, uh, with gesso and with primers and things. Uh, so I, it, it's partly to do with the way I'm trying to I'm trying to work with space. I mean, the the conventional sense of space in painting is that it, is that it goes into the painting like perspective, and and that somehow you're painting behind the painting, behind the plane of the painting. Uh, I don't think like that. Uh, I don't think of either the uh, the plane inside the painting, the, the plane of the painting in those terms at all. Like, I think in terms of three spaces, I think that I'm trying to paint paintings which are sort of coming outwards at the same time, that are sitting on the surface because it's paint as paint, so therefore it's on a flat surface, and it's paint inside the surface. So I'm trying to set up a space which is sort of uh, pulsing between being behind the picture plane and being in front of the picture plane, so that, it, so that it's a sort of uh, a very loose, amorphous space which is flowing in and out in front and behind the painting and having and keeping the, the, the weave of the canvas open that actually allows me to uh, to move behind that space and in front of that space it's, uh, it's practicality it's just a, a way of working some people has, has said that they feel uh, a human presence in your in your paintings uh, that that there is something something uh, not directly uh, uh, an image of a human being but some kind of human presence in it what, what do you have for how, how can you comment that well i think uh, i think all my work has got something to do with the human presence i mean for instance this particular group the assembly paintings I, I do see them as being a, a, like a cluster or an assembly of figures somehow. Uh, equally, the, the paintings in the current exhibition in, in Stockholm, the 12 standing, I see those as being single standing figures. Uh, I don't want to say that the works are figurative or they're about uh, people or about uh, the figure per se, but the, the idea of the human presence as being analogous to the presence of the painting, to the possibility of, of, a, of, a, of a kind of, uh, some kind of figure in the painting is very important to me. So, so I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring into the world, when I paint a painting, I'm trying to bring into the world some notion of a figure that is analogous to the human figure. So it's not the human figure, but it has the same properties and the same qualities as the human so it has fragilities, it has edges, it has, it has boundaries, and it has energies. Uh, and, and just in the same way, the human figure has all of these abstract qualities. So I believe a painting has all of these similar abstract qualities. So I'm trying to bring something that parallels the human figure, but actually isn't the human figure. It's quite abstract in a sense. It's not a, it's not a picture I'm after. It's a, it's a feeling. It's a feeling of something being, being analogous to the human figure. Uh, it's a little bit like when you meet someone for the first time and uh, you never see them again. You don't recognize the details of the figure. You don't recognize the color of their eyes necessarily or something like that, but you, but you do remember the feel of them, the general feel of the person, even if you've only met them very briefly. And, and when I, so I'm trying to build a painting that has that similar sense of recognition that recognizes a feeling if it doesn't recognize the particular details of someone. So I'm trying to build a feeling for an individual painting so that each painting establishes its own identity. It's, it's quite a tricky area to talk about because it isn't in the end about figuration. It's about trying to 
bring a body into the painting, which is actually the body of a painting, not the body of a figure. It's, it's, it's quite abstract, the whole, the whole area. But, but for me, it's very important. I, 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 I see my own relationship to the painting. I mean, one of the reasons I prefer working with larger format paintings is that I see my own body and the, and the sort of physical body of the painting has been analogous that actually uh, we are one and the same thing in a way. I can't, I, I, when I'm working I can't separate myself out from the painting itself, I'm part of the painting in a way. And what goes into the painting is, uh, is just an extension of myself in a, in a very concrete sense, not just in terms of ideas but in terms of feelings, everything. In the exhibition in Stockholm, you're also showing five photographs, photographs of, of classical sculpture. And they have the same composition as the paintings. Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've been, uh, for about the last 10, 12 years or so, whenever I've been to museums, I've been uh, photographing standing sculptures. So whenever I go into a museum and I see a standing sculpture, it can be a Renaissance piece, it can be a, an African sculpture, it can be a Greek sculpture, it can be something from the 19th century. Then I, then I just photograph them and I, I'm interested in, it relates to the, to the point I was talking about earlier, I'm interested in the, in the kind of uh, energy and the kind of aura that these sculptures are capable of, of presenting. Uh, you know, what is it when you take just a, a dumb, stupid material like a, a piece of stone or something? How do, you, how do you make it more than just a picture of something? How do you actually give it a presence? And, and so I'm interested in the extent to which these standing figures can actually, uh, can actually present some kind of more abstract notion of an energy and a force, a kind of force field around them. And, and, and by extension, I'm interested in, 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 in how I can extend that into the, into the area of painting. How can I, how can I give a painting a, a sense of a body which is energized, which is actually alive? And so, they, so they, the, the photographs in, in, in Stockholm are very much a part of a dialogue going on with the paintings, so, so it, it's about that. I mean, they function in a, a very different way to the photographs that are in the exhibition at Umeå, which, which stand outside the paintings, are quite separate to the paintings. The, um, the, the ones in Stockholm of the, of the standing sculptures very much reflect similar concerns to the paintings. Uh, I, I, I work a lot with photographs because it's, a, a, it's such a, a different medium. When you're painting a, a large group of paintings, uh, you often go for a year when not a single painting is finished, uh, when they're all in sort of process of development. And uh, so, that, so things are left completely open and you, and you wonder, you know, sort of, when will something become concrete? When will something become solid? When, when, when will I actually have something that I can call a painting? And what I like about the photographs is it's such a, an immediate medium. You take a photograph, you process the film, you develop it, and you have very quickly have an image. And it's a concrete image. So if you photographed, a, uh, uh, say, a teapot with the light shining on it, or if you have photographed uh, a chair, with shadows reflecting onto the wall or something like that. So it's something very concrete in the world. And I like that immediacy and that concreteness because the paintings never have that. I'm always trying to leave the paintings in a state of incompletion in a way, whereby I'm suggesting subject matter and I'm suggesting references in the world, but actually they're never consolidated. They're, they're left in a, in a sort of slightly twilight zone whereby one knows one's looking at something one could recognize, but at the same time one, one can't quite put one's finger on it. So the, so the photographs just sometimes allow me to see something and present something very concrete in the world. So they're like a complement to the paintings. Mm. So tell me, I'm interested in understanding how you decide when 
her painting is finished. You have you have this group of paintings. Are they all finished at the same time, or, or? No, it's it's. Uh, it, I, I don't I don't decide. Uh, uh, there was a very interesting. Uh, I think it was uh, Ad Reinhardt. I think it was was taking part in a symposium a symposium in America with some of the other abstract American painters, and the question arose in this symposium: How do you how do you know when a painting is finished? And he raised a, what for me is a really interesting question. He said, actually, the question isn't how do you know when a painting is finished, but it's how, when to start a painting. Uh, I, I believe that in starting a painting, implicitly, you also finish a painting. That, that the criteria by which you come to the end of a painting is already held in the moment of starting it. So the, so the painting finishes itself because it's been started. In that sense, I try to paint clean paintings. I don't start on a painting and then halfway through it think, oh, it shouldn't be a blue painting after all, it should be a red one, or it shouldn't be a white painting, it should be a green one. I, I, I start with a very clear intention, and I just then have to see it through. And, and how do you start it? Sir? How do you start? I start it by, uh, by fidgeting around it for weeks, and, and then at some point saying, okay, it's going to be a blue painting, or it's going to be a red painting, or it's going to be a, a white painting, or a blue and white painting. And, and having a, I can't see the painting, but I can feel the painting. I can feel its, uh, I can feel its, its warmth or its coolness. I can, f I can feel its kind of energies. And I can feel it's, it's sort of the feel of it. I can just have a sense of the feel of it. And then I've got to go with that feel and I've got to hold on to that feel. feel. So for instance, when I'm, when I'm working on a painting and then I put it aside for a month and then I come back to it a month later, I don't just immediately pick it up and start painting. I'll often sit with that painting in the studio for a week just getting to know it again. Just trying to get my head back into that particular painting. And then once I feel I've got my head back into it, then I can start working on it again. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a question of just trying to stay with what feels true to the painting. And, and if I s stay with that, then the painting will automatically finish itself. So I, I, I may stop working on a painting because I don't know what to do with it next. I put it aside for a month or even three months or something. Then I get it out again and I look at it again and I might sit with it for a few days. And if at the end of that I think, oh, I still don't know what to do, then I put it away again, and then I get it out again. And maybe three months later, I still haven't done anything else to it. So I think, well, actually, perhaps the painting's finished at that juncture. I don't know what to do to it, so the painting must be finished. But, it, but it's not something like I make a snap, snap decision. I don't uh, work on a painting in the morning and then in the afternoon say, ah, oh, it must be finished. It, it's a long, slow process of, of just letting the painting settle down. And once it's settled down and I feel there's nothing else I can add to it, then it must be finished. And that, that's one of the reasons why I don't like making paintings for exhibitions, because I want them to have that time to settle down and to find themselves, and for me to be comfortable, comfortable with them rather than feeling I've actually got to say, oh, it's finished because it's got to go into an exhibition. Uh, so that's all part of why I prefer to work the way I do. So they, they sort of finish themselves. They, the critical part is the beginning of getting that right and being, being true to what I feel is the, the specific intent of an individual painting. And if I get that right in the beginning, then, then the painting tends to sort of look after itself as it goes along. It's, uh, it's, it's part of the discipline of working with the pieces in a way. As you described to me earlier, when you start, there is, a, there is something of, of there, there is something randomly about the start as well, because you're poor in paint, right? Yeah, the, the, all, all of the, uh, once I've decided if I work on cotton or if I work on linen, then the initial painting, uh, for instance, all of this, these very soft uh, sort of blend sections behind these, these areas, 
there at the port, so my, my first act is that I lay the painting flat on the ground, it's stretched, and I lay it on the ground. And then I pour very, very diluted oil paint onto the surface, and it pools, it creates these, these sort of amorphous pools of, of color. And then that's allowed to dry out sometimes for several weeks. And then the overpainting starts, uh, and this is all in acrylic. This, uh, these forms are, are built up in uh, built up in acrylic, and I tend to work with uh, different transparencies. So, uh, so particularly with the white paintings, I'll, I'll have uh, five or six different pots of white, all with different uh, opacities and transparencies, and I and I just keep building the layers up and building the layers up until it begins to resolve itself. Mm, and that you're controlling, but the first step you're not 100% controlling. Well, it, it's true in the sense that when you, when you pour, you can't see to what extent the, uh, the paint is going to disperse across the surface. But actually, you, you get pretty good at, uh, you get quite good at control, although it seems a random process. You, you get pretty good at controlling it, but then I wouldn't want to control it 100% because then I would have nothing to work against when I paint the painting. So actually having that that slight openness in the beginning and, that's, and that slight, uh, it's not out of control because it is control, but it's, but it's nevertheless uh, got a life of its own. It's sort of jumped outside of me and it's, got, and it's taken on a life of its own. It, it, it allows me to have something to sort of work against. So, so for me that, uh, because painting a painting is a, is in a sense a dialogue between control and, and uh, you know, paint itself is just a stupid liquid, it's just a, a liquid, you know, and it can go all over the place, it can, it, it's got a life of its own. And so painting any painting is a, is a kind of uh, an interplay between controlling it and using it or allowing it to use itself for what it is, which is a fluid liquid. And it, it seems to me that part of the quality of painting is that relationship between control and apparent randomness that the nature of the paint itself has. And that, and that that gives painting a particular quality if you can harness those two things together, a kind of control and a kind of arbitrariness that comes with the nature of paint itself. And the, and the technique you're using with this uh, diluted acrylic, it, 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 uh, it is a little bit like a watercolor. You can't change much. I mean, if you were painting with oil paint, thick oil paint, you could always paint over and redo something, but it's, it's difficult for you to change anything that you had. No, that, yeah, that's right. I, I, I can't change things because everything is visible. I, I try to paint paintings where everything I put down is actually visible. So there's no idea of, of using thick oil paint or something. As you say, well, you can just paint over it if you don't like it. Uh, so in my case, if the painting goes wrong, in that uh, uh, I feel I, I haven't held on to it, and it, it's sort of wandered off somewhere, and it's not going where I want it to go, then actually I just destroy it. I just take it off the stretcher. I throw it away, and I start on the same painting all over again. And it's not, it's not unusual for me to try and paint the same painting two or three times. Uh, especially when I'm starting a group, uh, usually the first uh, three or four in the group uh, won't survive. They get so far and then, uh, because I'm working with a new size or I'm working with a new format, uh, and I need to get to know it, often the first two or three won't survive. They'll, I'll, take, I'll work on them for months and months, but in the end I'll end up throwing them away just because I couldn't get them clean enough. It's as if I need to practice to get into the area. So, so when, I, when I feel a painting's losing itself, the notion of covering it up just isn't there, so I, I, I just have to scrap it and start again. But I like that. I like that. Uh, I like that uh, clarity, and obviously, uh, in terms of the way I work, uh, one of the things I've got to be trying to establish all the time is that I'm is that I'm alert enough to actually stay with the painting, to actually keep the, the painting clean and crisp. It's it's a bit like uh, it's not dissimilar to being a professional sportsman or something like that. You've actually got to. I've actually got to train for it. <laughs> it's, that's, 
So, th so does it happen that you start with a painting and to solve a problem you have alternative ways and you make another painting and you go both ways? Uh, I, I try not to confuse... Uh, it's tricky. If, you, if you're working on big paintings, which take a long, long time, there is a, there is a tendency to, to want to put a lot into them because it's a big painting, so you think it has to be a big statement, so, so you have a lot in it. But in fact, the, 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 it, the opposite is true. The bigger the painting, the less you should put in it, the simpler it should be, because otherwise it gets too complicated. So what will happen is that I may start on a painting, and if, if, if it isn't working, then I have to make some kind of decision, you know, is it working because it's got too complicated or because the painting got too cloggy and, and just too messy? And, and then I, th I might think, okay, I, I, the forms are getting too, I might think the forms are getting too complicated, uh, the whole painting is just too cluttered, the color's too busy or something like that. Then I say, okay, then I should never have put blue with red or something like that, I should have just done it blue with white or, so, so then I may think, okay, this shouldn't be one painting, it should be two paintings. So, so I let one of them go one way and the other one go the other way. And so that happens, that, that uh, sometimes uh, a painting that is lost just has too many ideas in it and they have to become separate paintings rather than actually being put together in one painting. And you have to start all over again with two canvases. Yeah, then I would start, with, then I would follow the idea with I would think, okay, this part of the idea should go into that painting, and this part of the idea should go into this painting, and it should be two. Yeah, exactly. And, and if uh, if they work, then it's you know it's fine. Mm -hmm. But if by chance one of them still doesn't work, then again it gets it gets thrown away. It's what I what I tend to do is I I I, I work on a group of paintings, and I tend, whilst I'm working on them, not to change size. So if all the paintings are, say, this size, which is 190 by 270, I just stay with that size for that whole group. And then at the end of a group, what I tend to do is I tend to clear the studio and make paperwork. So I make gouaches or something like that. And I use that as a kind of uh, clearing out process. So it's like I'm taking all of the ideas that I could have that other paintings in that group could have gone into. And I explore those through the gouaches. So they become sort of like uh, later alternatives of what paintings could be. And then at the same time, I'm preparing myself to s start working on another group of paintings. So uh, I don't, when I'm working on a daily basis, I don't make drawings or I don't make uh, watercolors or anything. I just paint the paintings. And then when I finish the paintings, then I might make drawings or I might wait because I find if I do it at the same time I'm making the paintings, it, it just gets in the way. It just introduces more elements and more complications rather than simplifying things for me. And tell me what happens. If, if you started with a, with a series of, let, let's say, 12 paintings, mm -hmm. so over a period, I guess it will take a few months for you to realize that, okay, this group is finished. Uh, how, how long does it take before you start the next series? Oh, uh, usually uh, minimum three or four months. When I when I will make some paperwork, so I'll uh, I'll I'll decide if, uh, for instance, this group were all horizontal. Uh, then I did uh, after these paintings, the assembly paintings, I did twelve standing, which are all vertical. Uh, so, you know, I may, th I may be working on a group and I may, th and I may think, okay, I, I explored certain things to do with the horizontal composition in that group, but now I'd like to look at something that's much more vertical, uh, that, that works in quite a different way. And then I've got to get my head around how big that should be, uh, what, what I should be trying to do with them, all, all those kind of things. So that takes a few months for me to sort of get my head around all of that. And then I just hang around in the studio. I, I, as I said, I tape up a, a size that I think I'm interested. I might make some paperwork. Uh, I might try and make one or two smaller paintings, uh, just uh, just to sort of keep myself painting. And uh, and then perhaps three or four months later, I, I start on another group. So it's a sort of natural cycle for me. Uh, it's it's. Uh, 
I can't go immediately from one group to the next. I have to have a kind of breathing space in between. It ha but for me, it has a very natural rhythm to it, so mm -hmm. I'm quite comfortable with it. So when you sign the, the paintings and you date them, it's always a, you, you never date them one single year, or how do you do it? I date them all when they leave. Okay. So, so all, all I, if, say I paint, uh, say I paint 12 paintings over uh, two years, 12 big paintings over two years, then, then they all just have uh, uh, the dates, the, the year they start, the year they finish, but I don't identify them as having a particular finishing date. They all just have the same year starting, the same year finishing. Because I never know which one, uh, in the end I never know which one I started first and which one was finished first. I mean, people often say to me oh, when I sh show a group together, they say, oh, which one was the first one you painted and which one was the last one you painted? And I never know. Uh, they, they all just sort of finish themselves as it goes along. And so they all have, they all have the same dates on them uh, because they're part of a body of work that started around the same time and finished around the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and in a sense, things are only truly finished when they leave the studio. Mm -hmm. So, so usually when we're getting stuff ready to pack up for it to be transported, then I sign the back of the paintings one or two days before they leave. Uh, you know, that's it. So a painting could have been finished a year before, but it's just been sitting in the studio and it hasn't gone anywhere. So uh, it gets dated when it leaves the studio. I'm trying to remember some of the things you said over the, this week. You, you, you said something interesting about Joseph Brodsky. What was that? Well, Brodsky, uh, what I like about Joseph Brodsky is, I think he's a wonderful poet, but he, he talked about time. He said that uh, time, unlike water, flows horizontally. And, and uh, people tend to think that painting is essentially about time. Because painting is pictorial and it's a picture, they think that it's about space, that, that one is dealing with space, some notion of space. But for me, uh, perhaps even more important than space is a notion of time, is that, is that one is actually trying to, trying to build into a painting some notion of time. A very open-ended and quite slow notion of time. And so I like, uh, I like Borowski's thought, because if, if, uh, if time is going horizontally, then by inference, uh, space is going vertical. Space is vertical. And so I like that uh, we tend to think that space is horizontal, and we tend to think that time is just some vague abstraction. But I like the idea that space might be vertical, and that time might be horizontal, and it might be like a kind of two dimensions, two different dimensions that you could actually uh, work with in a painting. And certainly for me, in working on large groups over quite long periods of time, uh, giving the paintings time and actually allowing them to accumulate time, because I believe that paintings accumulate time even when you're not working on them, but if they're just sitting in the side of the corner of the studio, the fact that you are continuing to live your life and you're doing something else, that will find its way into the painting. Uh, for instance, I would never dream of painting a painting from beginning to end all at once, because for me it would have one sense of time in it, one, one moment or one kind of heat out of my life. Uh, I, I would never want that. I would want a painting which is accumulating moments of my life in different, part, different times of my life. So it's a much slower, lengthier process, a, a longer sense of time. And I, and I think that actually when you when you come to paintings, you can actually sense that. I think people can't necessarily articulate it when they come to a painting, but I think, I would hope that they can actually sense that time when they come to the painting, that they're not only seeing something visual, but they're actually getting some sort of experiential sense of time at the same time. You also said something about getting to know a painting in a similar way that you're getting to know another person. Uh, could you could you comment that? Well, I, th I think I think uh, paintings are, are are meant to be lived with, uh, and they're meant to actually be experienced in the way that in the way that uh, 
in the way that one goes through life and one gets to know some people well and, and you know they become friends and they become valuable parts of one's life. They become they be, they connect to you and they actually enrich your life and they make it you know they make it a, a better life. I, I, I think that uh, paintings can play the same role. I don't I don't see them as being some. Uh, some sort of anonymous thing that one just looks at and then moves away from and that's the end of it. I mean, there are certain paintings in the world that I keep going back to. They are, they are like uh, touchstones. And they're, the, they're like friends that I, I keep going, I keep revisiting and, the, and they, they, they feed me as an artist. And I think that paintings have the capacity to do that, that you can actually live with them and uh, they, yeah, they can, they can be an, an enriching and a developing part of one's life, that, 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 that they have the capacity to actually do that. And that the artist or the painter, uh, for me, I would think, in the end, is actually trying to do that. It's trying to establish a painting that has the capacity to do that, not just to be looked at, but to be experienced ongoingly and actually become a part of one's life. Tell us a little bit of some paint paintings that you come back to. Uh, I, I, I'm very interested in, uh, for instance, I'm very interested in early Italian painting. I, I, uh, there's a particular painting by Simone Martini of the Annunciation, where, where you have uh, Angel Gabriel on one side and you have the Virgin Mary on the other, and, and then you have a gap in the middle, which is this sort of pregnant, empty space. Uh, and for me it's a fantastic painting because the, the Ostensibly, the theme of the painting is the two figures, but in reality, the theme of the painting is the empty space. It's the pregnant space between them. And for me, it's a, I, mean, I think this was painted in the 13th century. It's a fantastic painting because it's sort of saying, okay, you have two figures, but actually the, the real meaning of the painting lies in the gap between the two figures, where there's, and there's nothing there. And I find that just an incredibly beautiful image. Uh, I'm very interested in uh, Russian icons because of their frontality. Uh, I think as human beings we're very frontal, we do everything forwards. Uh, you know, our senses and everything, and our hands and legs and everything function in a very frontal way. And equally a painting is very flat and is very frontal. And so I'm very interested in this relationship between the frontality of myself as a human being and the frontality of the painting and how those two things find each other. And for me, Russian icons, which uh, usually depict the figure standing facing out in a very flat way, have something of this frontality, so, so they intrigue me enormously. Uh, I mean, uh, certain artists, just because of their sensibilities, like Edvard Munch, uh, I consider a, a, a very important painter for me, just because of his subject matter and his capacity to to energize his figures with a kind of a glow. It's as, if, it's as if they're like charged batteries. You know, they, they, they emanate a kind of inner, inner heat. And that, that quality intrigues me. Uh, I'm, so I'm, I'm drawn to, to paintings from quite a broad spectrum. Uh, but they're all paintings which seem to, which seem to feed back into the areas that I'm, that I'm actually dealing with. That I'm trying to touch on myself as a, as a painter. I know that you went to see Hilma Klint at the Modern Museum. Yeah. How, how did you find that exhibition? I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was quite outstanding. Uh, I'd seen a. I saw an exhibition of her work about uh, 20 years ago. A, a small exhibition of just drawings in. in uh, in, I, I can't, can't remember the museum, but it was in Helsinki about 20 years ago, and I, and I still have the catalogue at home. I was always, I was always very, I was, I was very impressed with it then, and I, th I thought the uh, the exhibition in Modern Museum is absolutely outstanding. There, there's something about the it's complex to talk about, but uh, there's something about that period of work in the in the 19 early 20th century. Uh, when some artists were dealing with formal problems uh, to do with painting and other artists weren't, they were dealing actually with a much deeper philosophical problem of, of, uh, of the relationship between what it actually means to be a human being 
and what it means to say something visual about that. And I think she's one of those artists. I think she's a very deep artist. Uh, and actually that's probably one of the reasons why she's been obscured for a long time, because I think she's quite a difficult artist to deal with. But I think her work is, is, is really, really important. She's, she's touching upon so many uh, sort of difficult areas in painting and difficult areas in, in image making that, uh, that are key to what subsequently happened. I mean, you look at her work and you, uh, you can see Louise Bourgeois in there, some of the drawings, you look at anything, on, you know, uh, uh, or, you, or you think of uh, Mondrian, all sorts of people. You can, you, can, you can see that she sort of, she was already touching on all of these areas. And, and it's, uh, it's as if she's trying to, how, how can I put it? It's, it's, it's as if she, many artists, they, they make work which is about painting. She didn't do that. She made, she made work which was deeper than that, which was actually about what it is to be a human being and, and how her own intellect and her own thinking could actually manifest itself as painting. So it's a bigger, it's a much bigger thing. And, and I, I like that. I like that aspiration that actually you're not making academic paintings about paintings, but you're actually trying to bring to painting the whole philosophy of self, that you're actually trying to declare yourself as a thinking being which manifests itself through the form of painting. Uh, it's, uh, it's, so for me it, it was a beautiful, beautiful exhibition. I, I was very, uh, really impressed, really, really impressed. But what you just said, isn't that what you're trying to do as well? Yeah, of course. I suppose so. In my own way, that's what I'm trying to do. But I, I think what I'm what I'm trying to say with uh, Hilma of Klimt is that uh, it's not so often now that you see work that has that uh, that absolute uh, determination to do that. Uh, so much art now is is about art. It, it's a sort of it's like a trick on art. It's like a game with art. Oh, X did this one year, so I will do that the next year. Or it's quoting other people's work, uh, so it's clever in that it it has a reference to this or a reference to that. It's, it's a very sort of postmodern position, but so much work now has that as its kind of uh, as its guiding principle. And for me, it's so shallow. It's so it's so hollow. Uh, and so the the opportunity to sort of find another artist who in a sense has been overlooked for so long, where you look at it and you kind of think, yes, but it's so much deeper than that, it's so much richer than that, it's just so rewarding. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's enhancing, it's very affirming. I thought it was an incredibly, if you're a painter, to see her exhibition was a very affirming experience in, in that, that painting can actually uh, be more than just about art, that actually can go deeper than that. That's a very good final one, I think. Yeah, okay. Shall we, uh, um, are we done? I think so. Let's, let's look at it and see what, how, it, how it came out. We've done